Revelation chapter 6. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach this in this way. You can disagree with me if you want. I just will just always believe that you're wrong. But you can disagree with me if you want. I believe that God's true born-again church will endure a time of persecution and affliction before the translation, before the resurrection, before the rapture, any of those words apply. Um, I do believe that. I know it doesn't quite match up with how some people have drawn out. It's, to me, it's funny how people have drawn out a map of how they think everything is going to happen. And I just don't, I don't personally understand Bible prophecy well enough to be able to say at 12.05, God's going to do this. And then on Tuesday, December the 2nd, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, God's going to do this. I just don't have it that firm in my mind. But I do believe that God's people will suffer persecution. And I'll give you a word to look up in your Bible. This is your homework. Okay? So I'll be gone all week, and while I'm gone, you do your homework. Look up every place in the Bible where the word tribulation is used. Tribulation or tribulations, plural. It's only two, it only, only comes in two forms. Tribulation and tribulations. Look up every verse where that word is in there. And then ask the question, does the Bible say anything about us as born again believers enduring temp tribulation? Does it say anything about that? I will not give you the answer yet. Okay? But you look it up. You look it up, all right? Now, in Revelation 6, verse 9, when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Ask another question. Has there ever been times when true born-again Christians have suffered affliction, persecution, even death. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, try being a born-again, Bible-believing Christian in Pakistan. Now, believe it or not, there are some churches in Pakistan. One of the guys that is with Southwest Radio, uh, Dr. Larry Spargimino, I've known him for years. I love him to death. Uh, he's a good man of God, solid King James. He started or got hooked in with uh, a church in Pakistan and went and spent time over there with them, ministering to them, teaching them, showing them things out of the word of God. Um, was talking to Dr. Bob Glaze, who used to be like the station manager there at the time Noah Hutchings was there. And I, I had asked Bob... Had he ever gone to Pakistan with Brother Larry Spargimino? And he said, yeah. He said, they're good people over there. The food is horrible. Okay, I'm glad to know that. <laughs> Apparently it's bad. But anyway, um, there are some true born-again Christians over there. And you know what? Some of them have had their church burnt down while they were in it. The Muslim extremists, or listen to this, even, even some of the, the um, Hindus, because Pakistan and India are neighbors, and there's a commonality there. Even, even the, those of the Hindu faith will persecute 
Bible-believing Christians. Uh, Pastor Lordson Rock, who has been here before, we support his, uh, his ministry every month. And um, he said that they get persecuted quite a bit sometimes. He is in a, an area of India that the majority of it is Catholic. And then I, th I think the second uh, biggest religion would be Hindu. And um, he, he actually gets, gets trouble from both groups. But when you're the devil and you see God's people, you hate them. And you're going to try to do whatever it takes. The devil never has figured out this one thing. The devil might be able to scare those who are not saved. He might be able to chase them out of church. But those who are truly born again, nothing stands in our way. Nothing stands in our way. Yeah? Well, yeah, but... Not persecution, not tribulation, not suffering, nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So, verse 11, white robes were given unto every one of them. That goes to Revelation 19. The white robes are the righteousness that God has given us. He has covered us in his own righteousness. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So just a couple places this morning I want you to turn to in your Bibles, and we'll look at the suffering of, of, of saints. First Peter, in fact, I would, I would encourage you to do your own personal uh, study of First Peter. Years ago, when God was leading me to study prophecy, he drew my attention to 1 Peter, and I read every bit of it, and I went, whoa, I didn't know all that. 1 Peter chapter 2, the whole book of 1 Peter deals with us suffering for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of God's word, for the sake of our testimony. And Peter tells us in here, there's two things, there's two reasons why you would be under some sort of tribulation or trouble. One is that you have gotten off into some sin and God is going to use suffering to chasten you out of it, to get you back in line. Okay, he's going to use a rod against you. And Peter addresses that in here and he says, if, you like, if you're like in sin and you're suffering, what glory is that? You're getting what you had, you're getting, in fact, you're getting better than what you deserved. But there's really no glory in it. But he said, but and if you suffer... For righteousness sake, what glory there is. Okay? So 1 Peter 2.20. For what glory is it? If when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. And you can, re you can write next to there if you want to write Hebrews 12. And Job 5. Hebrews 12, Job 5. Because both of those passages... Show us the love of God um, through God chastening us. My mama loved me so much. At least six to seven times she loved me in a day. That's how many swings she took with my belt, six or seven. If she stopped at six, I'd say, Mom, that's six. Seven makes it perfect, so whap, one more time. No, I never said that. I never said that. But that's Hebrews 12, Job 5, both said this. 
here's God's hand. The hand that wounded you is the same hand after he's wounded you, he's going to heal you. Because after you get a whipping from your mom or your dad or whoever, they'd say, now come here. They'd give you a big old hug and a kiss. Mama don't want you acting that way no more. Daddy doesn't want you doing those things no more. Okay, I don't like whipping you, but I have to so that you learn the difference between right and wrong and you learn that wrong things will bring pain and suffering to your life. And how true is that? So he said, but if you, if you back in 1 Peter, it, it, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Now, us as Americans, our liberty is a, it's a blessing, but it is also a flaw that we have. Because as Americans, we are so used to demanding that our rights be upheld, demanding that the government be limited and it's we the people, that a lot of American Christians are not used to the idea of suffering or being persecuted, especially by a government. But I think we can see it headed in that direction. And I would say, take every day, one day at a time. And if God puts a tyrant over this country and bans and outlaws the hate speech of the gospel, we are still going to preach the gospel, but we must be ready to accept the consequences that go along with it. Okay? Uh, verse 21, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. In other words, if it was good enough for Jesus, who did nothing wrong, yet was persecuted, then it should be good enough for us. And he said uh, that you should follow in his steps. Now, up on this table here, covered with a little pretty cloth here, but it says, this do in remembrance of me. And Christ, when he said that, he, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, drank it. He said, this is the cup of my blood of the new, in the New Testament. Do this in remembrance of me. The blood that was spilled. The body that was broken. He's telling us that if your blood is spilled and your body is broken for your testimony in Jesus Christ, you're doing it unto the Lord. And not for your own glory. Verse 22. Who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled. Reviled not again. And that in itself. Is a. It's, it's a double edged sword. It's a blessing and a curse. Because we as Americans. Have the right to. Of free speech except for on YouTube I'm almost out of YouTube jail but we have the right of free speech in this country that if we don't like something we don't like a politician we don't like something the government did we have a right to freely assemble and let the government hear our voice but did Jesus do that before he went to the cross Mm -mm. He let him do it. Why? Because he knew that through his suffering and his death, it would mean glory for him and salvation for the world. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But committed himself to him that judges righteously. And I want you to underline that phrase in your Bible. Committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. 
Here's something that I've learned. In, in all the years I've been a Christian, all the years that I've served as a pastor, as an administrator, you know, having a Christian school here, having a daycare here, now the ministry that we have now. There were times when I knew something was wrong in the church, but I didn't know what it was. And a lot of times I would just lay it out before the Lord. God, there's something not right. I don't know if it's me. I don't know if it's somebody else. God, if it's me, beat me until it's not me anymore. If it's somebody else, show it to me. And Lord, if I'm wrong, then chasten me. But Father, if it be somebody else, God, I would rather you judge the situation than me judge the situation. And I have found that God does a whole lot better judging it and doing it himself than if I were to do it. Now, there is, there, Jesus gave us a situation, a scenario on how to deal with sin in the church. He gave us a scenario how to do that. That's to be done. You're supposed to go to them privately to restore them, not kick them out. Uh, if they will not repent, then you take a witness with you and beg them, please reconsider. If they will not confess any sin then, and you are 100% sure that they're guilty of it, you bring it before the church. I don't ever want to have to do that. Okay? I don't ever want to have to do that. But that's the scenario, that's the rules that our Savior gave us for it. Letting God judge the situation. Um, verse 24, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray. But, now, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And it's really interesting. The word pastor and the word bishop, both of them have their roots in what a shepherd does. The word pastor is related to the word pasture, and who eats in a pasture? Sheep, cattle, goats, whatever. Okay? So the man who is over the sheep and over the goats in the pasture is the pastor. And it's the same with the word bishop. All of those words, when you chase down the root of them, all of them apply to the idea of that Christ is the bishop, chief bishop. Christ is the shepherd, the chief shepherd. I am an under shepherd of the chief shepherd. And what that means is I can't just go about doing it my way. I have to follow Christ and his instructions. Okay. Then first Peter chapter three. Now watch this. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Now. What he's not saying here, he's not saying, if you just follow that which is good, nobody will ever hurt you. Or no, you'll never be persecuted. That is not what he's saying here. What he's saying is, if you will follow Christ and his righteousness, they can't beat on you hard enough to hurt you. They can't drive you and persecute you and give you... Uh, beatings and whippings and threaten you with death. They cannot chase you away from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? What did Paul say about himself? So how many times was he whipped? Forty times saved the one. Like three times. Then they took him out one night and they stoned him to death. And he was laying there and they thought he was dead. 
And when all the people that hated him walked off because he's dead, all the saints stood around him crying. And Paul got up and said, what are you guys crying about? What, what happened? Oh, that? <laughs> that didn't hurt. Uh, <laughs> then he's, then he stuck out in the middle of the sea, clinging to pieces of the ship that he was on for I don't know how many days, night and day in the cold sea, thinking at any minute they're all going to die. And yet, lo and behold, they land on an island and everybody's just fine. I mean, Paul, had, he took it all, amen? And he said, it's, it's just better that way. Um, who is it that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Several years ago, one winter, I was, I had a, already had a pretty bad cold and I had to do uh, some things, um, I don't want to get too deep into the story, but anyway, I had to spend the better part of my afternoon outside, and it was really cold outside. And I was in the church van, we had some of our school kids in there, and as we came back, and I pulled in, I'm trying to walk to this front door, and I'm not doing so well. And somebody ran in and told my wife, uh, has... Pastor Mike is out there and he can just barely breathe. And my wife went running. She, what's going on with you? <sighs> so she took me to the ER. And of course, everybody was sick that same time. So I'm laying in this room and they're doubling people up in the room. And I'm laying in this room and they've got oxygen on me. I've got pneumonia. And then I can hear a couple of women, a couple of curtains down in the same room. And I laid there and listened to them for a while. And they was kind of nervous about something. I don't remember what it was. And this weak voice, with this weak, hacking cough voice, I said to those ladies, uh, Ma'am? And she said, Yeah. I said, I believe there are no accidents. I believe God has put me in this room with you for a reason. Can I pray with you too? Sounds like something serious is going on. I don't have to know what it is. But can I, here I am laying there just sick as a dog. Can I pray with you too? And they said, oh, absolutely. Would you? And I prayed for whoever it was in that bed. I couldn't see them. Don't know what was the matter with them. But as sick as I was, prayed for them. And I'll tell you, Anybody that tells you that when you get sick, it's because you don't trust God enough, they're lying through their teeth. I'm here to tell you that some of the best things God has ever done in me is when I've been laid out flat. God always revives me. God always shows me something. God always blesses. But if you suffer righteous, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Verse 17, look at this. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So according to this, is it a sin to be sick? No. In fact, some of the greatest blessings I've ever seen in people is at times when they were in bad shape, 
Uh, Melissa, I remember being with um, Edna Gebhardt. Tommy, um, Lisa and I were over there quite a bit while she was dying. She had colon cancer. And um, she was in and out of sleep a lot. And we were sitting there, and one time she woke up, and she said, Jesus is in this room right now. I just saw him. I believed her. I believed every word. And just glory coming out of her. Whew. I can't wait for that day to see Jesus in the room. Amen? Amen. Amen. First Peter 4. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. He did not tell you if you're right with God, you'll never be persecuted, you'll never suffer, you'll never be sick, you'll never have any infirmities. He never said that. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. How true is that? That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. My sincerest desire is that I can serve God more, better, than I ever have at any time in my past. And I want the sins, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, I want those gone so that I can spend the rest of my time serving God. Mm. First Peter 4.12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. I'm going to learn that word, fiery trial. Two words. As though some strange thing happened to you. And I remember, Gary, the first time I read that, I went, that sounds to me like, like how everybody believes that nothing's going to happen to us and then we're going to be raptured and we all get to have the party while everybody else down here on the earth suffers. And yet, here's Peter saying, when the fiery trial comes and you haven't been raptured yet, don't think that that's some strange thing. Because God, I don't, I don't believe God ever promised anybody that they wouldn't have to suffer. I don't think God promised anybody that. But rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you, and on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So you're getting the idea that there are going to be trials, sufferings, persecutions, infirmities, um, troubles, mourning, grieving. As saints, if Christ suffered, we're going to suffer. If Christ suffered for righteousness, we're going to suffer for righteousness. Follow in the footsteps of Jesus, because where do they lead? They, read, they lead to Calvary. They lead to the place of crucifixion. The place of crucifixion for us is the day that Christ says to us, take up your cross and follow me. Do we not all have a cross to bear? Say amen. I've got mine. Uh, some I talk about, some I don't. One of the, and I never, I was never like this. Uh, it seems like since COVID, I don't know if it's a, if it's a byproduct of that or what. 
But there are days when I get hit with anxiety. I literally, I can't talk. Can't preach. Can't, there's, there's nothing there but this weird fear that is in me. And I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed. And sometimes it goes away and sometimes it doesn't. And it's very, very debilitating. It's crippling. If you've ever suffered that, if you've ever gone through that, if you've ever experienced that. And I know another pastor, I talked to him here a while back. Uh, he said since he had COVID, same thing. Boom. Another pastor, another pastor I know had a real bad situation in his church. He had a man that he fully trusted. That turned out this man and his wife both were like doing witchcraft on the side. And this guy turned on him, this pastor, and tried to get the church to get rid of him. And the church said, we're keeping him, we're getting rid of you, how's that? And he said, ever since that day, I've gone through days where I wasn't even sure that I could get out of bed. Because the fear, the anxiety, he said, that guy, that guy left a bucket full of devils all over me. And he said, some days I'm fine, some days I'm not. I am no good. That's our cross to bear. That's our cross. Yours could be different than mine. But it's a way of suffering. It's a way of taking this flesh and moving it out of the way so that this inner man can serve God. Amen. Amen. Father, bless your word today. Lord, bless these that will be traveling today. Uh, give them grace. Give them mercy, Father. Go with them and, and Lord, just bless us this week. Be with uh, Brother Sterling. Be with our family. Um, just bless your word today as we consider, Lord, these things that we've heard today. Lord, have you appointed for us a time in the future where we will suffer for the cause of Christ. Lord, I'd like to be able to say right now that I would be glad to endure that. But I won't know that, Lord, until the day it happens. So God, while things are well with me, God, would you hear me today? And when that day comes, God, would you be strong in us all? Because we'll have no strength in ourselves. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.